and welcome to the SciFest Movie Talk episode. So, in this episode I will be continuing my Jurassic journey um, and discussing the 2001 science fiction sequel, Jurassic Park 3, as directed this time round by Joe Johnston, taking over that, the directorial mantle, that's it, from Steven Spielberg, who directed the first two movies in the series. From what I understand, um, Johnston, who had previously directed the likes of 1989's Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, 1991's The Rocketeer, and 1995's excellent Jumanji, uh, to name a few, had been asking and asking Spielberg to let him direct a sequel to Jurassic Park ever since the first movie was released. And finally, was given the go with this entry into the franchise, with Spielberg now acting as executive producer. So, this is also the first um, in the series not to actually be based on a Michael Crichton novel. It does borrow elements um, from Jurassic Park, the, the novel, but ultimately it is merely based on the characters um, and, of course, the premise this time around. In this movie, we do see the return of Sam Neill reprising his role as paleontologist Dr Alan Grant from the first movie. And very briefly, Laura Den as paleobotanist Dr. Ellie Sattler, the only two uh, returning cast members from the previous movies in the series. Looking for further funding into his research into velociraptors, pertaining specifically to their potential for increased capacity for learning and social structure, Dr. Grant and his assistant Billy Brennan, as played by Alessandro Nivola, yep. Yeah, is basically conned into travelling to Isla Sauna, uh, or Site B, as it was known in The Lost World, um, by Paul and Amanda Kirby, um, as played by William H. Macy and Tia Leone, respectively. Yep, Tia Leone, that's it. Um, on the pretense that he would be a guide as they fly over the island on an adventure tour. However, um, the Kirbys are actually on a mission. Um, along with a bunch of hired mercenaries, to find their son, Eric, um, as played by Trevor Morgan, who had been flying over the island with a family friend, and before long have set down on the island, uh, much to Dr Grant's horror. Of course, um, this was indeed a stupid idea, um, and quickly, they're on their way, um, well, quickly, their only way off the island, that's it, is destroyed. What then follows is a relentless onslaught of dino attacks as our hapless bunch try in vain to find Eric and ultimately a way back off the island. So, I can't say that I don't love Jurassic Park 3. Because I do. Um, it is an extremely fun movie. But this is bittersweet to some extent. As a movie in the Jurassic Park series, it is somewhat subpar um, in terms of effects and overall story. A couple of shots of the dinosaurs look really cheap, um, and indeed I have always nicknamed this one uh, the one with the rubber suit dinosaurs, as that's the way it really does seem um, at times in several scenes. The care and the attention um, and, and, and attention to detail that present in the previous two movies with respect to the, the special effects, just kind of just doesn't seem to have been present in this entry uh, at all. In fact, I would say uh, that nearly all, if not all, the dinosaur action that we see is, is a little off. Uh, and by that, what I mean is that they don't actually do very much by wobble a little bit and shake their heads. They very rarely move. Um, the action shots only really show a big foot kind of coming down or a claw ripping through something. Most of the action is actually just simply implied in this sense, and, and this is very noticeable throughout, um, something I've noticed since I very first watched it. But what I would say is that this movie chooses to move away from the T-Rex and the Velociraptor antagonists, uh, which are featured so heavily in the previous movies. Instead, we feature a Spinosaurus as the main carnivorous people eater, um, and, and this movie features something teased ever since the ending of the original Jurassic Park. Pedetrodons? If I said it right? 
flying dinosaurs anyway. That's what we've got, flying dinosaurs. And that, that ain't half bad. The film does dare to be different, and for that, you have to give it credit. For the most part, it rehashes the only real plot a film like this can have. People running from dinosaurs. But at least we have some new dinosaurs to drool over. We do even have a T-Rex and Spinosaurus face-off, um, a ploy, of course, to assert in the dominance of the film's antagonists uh, against th the ones that we've come to fear from the previous movies against the Spinosaurus. I'm not quite sure that it worked as well as was intended, but hey, at least they tried, and it's probably one of the better CGI elements of the movie, if all told. Furthermore, the overall story, it's a bit basic, but punchy. Um, the film only runs for about an hour and a half, much, much less than the previous movies in the series, and gets really straight into the dino action as a result. Special effects wise, um, the first half of the movie is where the issues are, um, and they're noticeable more in the main, with a really truly shocking opening sequence involving pretty much, yeah, pretty much the worst superimposed sequence I have ever seen, and an attack on the plane chatted by the Kirby's, which is simply dire. But as the film goes on, the effects do actually get a little better. Um, and the scenes in the bed cage with the pedestrians, if I'm saying it right, were, were definitely worth the wait in my book. Um, and the finale with the Spinosaurus is actually fantastic. Um, real on the edge of your seat kind of stuff for the most part. But overall, um, the tone and direction of this movie um, now reminds me of a scene um, in in the Family Guy feature. I don't know if you've seen it, but based on a Star Wars A New Hope entitled Blue Harvest, where they do a joke um, about killing off John Williams, uh, being the original composer of the Star Wars theme, and then having to make do with music by Danny Elfman um, from there on in, with a very different artistic style. And this film kind of does feel a little like that. I definitely don't mind Johnston's work at all, but it stands out like a sore thumb with regards to this film when compared to the previous two in the franchise. As a side note, if you haven't seen the Family Guy uh, Star Wars parody series, I really do recommend it. Um, if, of course, you do like the kind of Family Guy style of comedy, um, they're not just a great take on Star Wars in general, but also, as is always the case with, with, with Family Guy, a great send-up of other pop culture too, so yeah. But anywho, the previous two movies were fun in their own right, but, but quite dark in places, whereas this film, it opts for a more light-hearted comedy approach. We have talking raptors um, and a Spinosaurus that swallows a satellite phone. From that point onwards, no matter how scary they do actually try and make the Spinosaurus appear, it simply doesn't build up the expected suspense uh, when it's playing a ringtone. Um, it's more comical than scary, you know? The acting it is also very mixed, with Sam Neill um, bringing back Dr. Alan Grant as though he'd never left. Um, he's, he's excellent, which was a welcome treat, um, along with well, along with his assistant, Alexandria Nivolia, who, who does play his assistant. Both, they played fairly decent roles. However, I am sorry to say, but the Kirby's, they're just simply irritating and played pretty panto uh, for most of the time. Not quite Macy's nor Leone's crowning achievement at all. And unfortunately, they don't get eaten, um, nor trampled on. It's actually quite hard to believe that they came up with the plan to rescue the sun like they did, or even had the resources to get as far as they did. And that's not to mention, I mean, who lets their kid go on such a trip in the first place? You know, additionally, there is a big play to kind of present the, the, their son, Eric, as this uncontrollable, um, do-what-they-want kind of child. But he ends up being the most sensible of them all. Anywho, um, finally, um, to finish, the film does bring back the familiar Jurassic Park theme I loved so much from the first movie, which is, is most certainly welcome following the lackluster themes of The Lost World. However, uh, John Williams, who penned the theme, does not return um, as a composer for this one, 
with that baton uh, instead being passed to Don Davis. As a result, whilst yes, we do have the familiar themes, these feel simply like they have been taken through a cut and paste job, with certain elements being hacked and spliced, pretty much like my editing skills, uh, with, with others. Um, at a much faster pace, I, I might add, which does leave the overall score feeling somewhat disjointed and, and fairly incidental, diminishing the expertly crafted original theme to try and force a sense of wonder onto the viewers. It, it just doesn't work. I think overall, if the movie had not actually been linked to Jurassic Park, um, it would have made an absolutely excellent creature feature. But against the previous two movies, it does struggle to hold its own for me. However, I do like the fact that this one is swift and to the point. It delivers what the audience wants most, the dinosaurs. Um, it gives us some new ones to drool over without any of the pretentiousness of the previous movies. I know that I have perhaps slated, uh, slated this one quite a bit, but overall this is meant to be simply a, a fun popcorn movie, uh, you know, a, a good adventure movie. And in that, it, it's, it does certainly deliver. Absolutely, yeah. So, that brings me to the end of this episode. Thank you very much for watching. I do hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please leave a like. Please do hit that subscribe button for more movie reviews, more trailer reactions, and more other movie-related content. Most of all, we've loved having you. Thank you for joining us. Um, see you again in the next Jurassic... Well, Jurassic World. Uh, yep, definitely. Yes, please do come back. And But otherwise, thank you for watching. Goodbye.